a good crowd here today. I guess a lot of people are interested in uh, getting their own business started, finally. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> We've had people on these webinars. Some, some folks have come to our training that have been on these webinars for, yes, years, plural. <laughs> <laughs> Which is okay because, hey, uh, they were putting their funds together, I guess, and getting their life uh, ready to get their business started. So this is a good time. The first of the year is when the doctors are looking back at the last year and going, what can I do differently? Exactly. Exactly. Hey, now, uh, Patrick, I, I know we've got a ton of information for us to get started with. So let's just pop, get in, into this thing. Yeah. And, uh, 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 and, and just for, uh, just to let everybody know that this is, it, this is live. We, again, certainly want to welcome your questions as you go through here. Uh, but I've also noticed here that we've kind of missing up the title, some of the title parts of our, our slides here. But that's okay. You you'll be able to follow right along. This slide. Let's talk about this one, Patrick, because I think this is where we're getting all of our information from for today. Yeah, this was an article in in, uh, in Medical Economics magazine, uh, and uh, I think my son Adam actually sent this out a, a week or so ago. And when we started reading it, we said, "Man, this is perfect. This is what we need to cover in our next webinar." So there's the reference for it. And guys, if you yeah, don't have time to write that down, then uh, just watch the recorded session of this and you can jot it down there if you want to. Anyway, uh, here's some of the things that... Uh, Let me tell you what they can do. They can yeah. Google that portion of it where it says the top 15 challenges facing physicians. You, you can just Google that. That'll yeah. get you right here into the medical economics portion of it. Yeah, and now there's 15, but we only decided to do 10. Why is that, Eric? Well, because uh, we wanted to, we if we did 15, uh, we'd be here for another hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, and some of them are more pertinent than others to to people who right. are wanting to get into medical billing. They really need to focus on these, so we just picked out the top 10 there. You can read about the other five <laughs> and see what we left out. Uh, but here they are in order that we're going to cover today. And Eric, I guess we just jump into the first one there, getting paid. That's a big problem for doctors. That's a challenge, isn't it? Not just next year, but... Uh, this past year as well. Yeah, exactly. Just the just the number one issue that that we we can see here is just the doctors getting paid. And and Patrick, you'd be surprised how many doctors are just not getting paid. And on this particular uh, article that we're we're pulling here, here is the five common reasons for claim denials. And so these are the reasons why doctors are simply not getting paid. This first one here is patients. Uh, isn't uh, eligible for services or hasn't shown proof of insurance. Would uh, known doctors check that out before they see a patient? Wouldn't they know if they're eligible or covered by insurance? Uh, you would think so. Here's here's what we've all, this is at least what we've heard from our licensees. And because you know, each licensee goes and does somewhat of a due diligence at each of those doctor's offices. What they found is, is that they'll check the patient in up at the front by just making sure they get their name and insurance card and they do what? They copy it and it goes in that file and then nobody checks to make sure that that insurance is actually good. Uh, you'd be surprised how many offices just don't check the proof of insurance. Yeah, and, and if they're not covered, then they have to just depend on the, they have to bill the uh, patient or get them to pay right there up front and sometimes uh, they don't. They, 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 they want the doctor to bill them. And then we know what happens to medical bills, right? They go to the yep. bottom of the stack of your bills, and they usually don't get paid until the very last minute, if ever. Well, here's, here's the problem with that, is that the doctor sees the patient. The doctor is expecting that someone at the front office is doing their job. Uh, yep. But by the time the patient leaves the office and it goes to the billing clerk, whether it's there in the office or to a medical billing company, you come to find out that at that point, that the patient didn't really have insurance. And now, so all of a sudden, Too late. now you're the yeah. money. Hey, now, Eric, I know you're going to cover this later in more detail probably, but the reason why our licensees don't have this problem and our doctors were collecting money for them is, is because we can check that eligibility before the patient even walks in the office, right? That is correct, yeah. And that's one of the biggest solutions that... I, that's probably one of the number one things, uh, Patrick, you know that we do demos for our licensees, for our doctors. And I, this is where I begin with those doctors, Patrick. I, I actually show the doctors what the iClaim system can do. And I'm telling you, that's, that's probably the biggest number one thing. And the doctors are going, that's the first thing I've seen so far that's actually going to help me collect more money. Right. Yeah, there's lots of solutions that we can provide them, but that's a biggie. That's a biggie for sure. 
that's that's that is huge. Number two, uh, you would think uh, as we go through here, the claims are missing codes, and the biller is using invalid codes. Now let, let's talk about those codes for a minute, because brand new people to this industry even kind of know probably that there's some kind of codes that are involved in medical billing, but. Let's go into that a little bit detail. These codes, uh, do people have to know these codes? They have to memorize all 53,000 of them, or what's the deal? Well, the good thing about it, as a medical billing company, it's not your responsibility to do the codes. There, there are two camps of people here. you got medical billers, and then you got medical coders, and then you have the doctors, basically. So basically three. It, it's the medical coders and the doctor's responsibility to get the medical billing company the proper codes. Yeah. So most doctors, if they've been in practice at any length of time, of course, or you have what they call a super bill, which is a sheet of paper that you've probably seen from the doctor that they circle these numbers, these codes for the various things that they find wrong with you and the various procedures that they're going to provide for you. And that's how they get paid from the insurance companies by those codes because uh, it's a standardized system that was come up with by the American Medical Association and the World Health Organization. So those codes are just something that the doctor already has in place or he gets that from a medical coding uh, coder, certified medical coder uh, that he's in co contact with or that maybe even works in his office. Exactly. Yeah, so the codes, again, just to keep it simple, the codes are supplied by the doctor or maybe they have a medical coder in their office, and but it's the, just the medical billing company's responsibility to take those codes and plug them in. But And as we'll see later, our system already has all of those codes built into the system, and it can double check to see that the doctor is uh, actually giving you the correct codes. Exactly. Number three, a particular service is simply not covered by the insurance. Let me say this in layman's terms. What this means is, is what the doctor is says is wrong with the patient doesn't match what the doctor did for the patient. <laughs> right. So he, he said, uh, more simple than that. Yeah. So one code uh, he put in is uh, you know uh, has problems with their sinuses, and the code for the procedure that he did was to remove a toenail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't exactly. match. Yeah, it don't match, and that happens quite frequently, Patrick. Yeah. I mean. These are the five common reasons, again, that we're not what we're basically saying, but this is some of the, it, it is things that we've said in the past, it's just that we are validating them through this big, big article that, that, we, that we're going through today. So the insurance company really uh, can reject that claim because it doesn't match. And then when that comes back to the doctor's office, it seems like all the doctors would go, oh, we'll just correct that and send it back in. But they got too much going on there. The office staff is doing a dozen different things, right? And they just don't have the time sometimes to go back. So those are the claims that get lost in the system and the doctor has to write off at the end of the year. Well, believe me, sometimes that's uh, $100,000 plus, isn't it, Terry? Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. They'd rather have that in their bank account, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Number four, the doctor didn't get prior approval or their staff didn't get prior approval for seeing the patient. You know, this is... This, this portion of it in that article goes even further in, in, in depth than that. But again, Patrick, can you imagine you, you go to the doctor's office and you've got some sort of insurance, but unless someone checks that to yeah. make sure that you're approved for the doctor to do that, guess what? The doctor's not going to get paid. Yep. And then there's just errors. I mean, human errors, right? That, that's a lot of the uh, reason why some claims are denied by the insurance companies. Right, exactly. And so to put bring it all back to a solution, uh, because we titled this this whole webinar is the challenges that the doctors face and how basically you as a new medical billing company can be positioned. And really the number one solution for everything that we've said so far is iClaim. That's right. Just a medical billing platform. Yeah, this is our uh, cloud-based system, folks, that you can access from any computer anywhere in the world that's connected to the internet and immediately access all of the records. The scheduler that you're looking at right here is built into it and all of that's accessible from anywhere. So one of the reasons why our, our ABS licensees don't have the problems that some medical billing companies do and the doctors inside their own office that are doing their own billing is because they don't have the right technology. So as we go through this, you'll see we emphasize that you have to have the leading edge technology that's kept up 
with all the changing rules and regulations. Otherwise, you'll get behind. Folks, that's the only reason, to be honest with you, that's the only reason why we've stayed in business for 20 years. We keep up. Right. And uh, there are some questions coming in. Dean, you're asking a question about the copay. Here we are, number two, copays and deductibles. <laughs> Good timing here. Hey, let, let's address, uh, I see one other question here. Let's get that one uh, answered also from Jory. Uh, Jory's just saying, is, is medical billing and coding experience and our training needed to be successful? We hope that what we just covered, Jory, kind of answers that question. But the answer is, most of our licensees that come through our training do not have any training whatsoever in medical billing or coding. They start from scratch, 95% of them. And uh, the few people who have come through that already have some of that background, of course, or probably got some advantages to knowing some of that stuff, but they'll find out once they get to using our system that they didn't really have to take those courses. That's the sad part. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, so further in this article, uh, number two as this one of the big issues that the doctors are facing is truly collecting copays and deductibles. It, it, Patrick, if we, if we just think about it, most people's deductibles are anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. And when those don't get collected, if you just think about it in a very simple format of how money flows, yeah, if the doctor's office doesn't collect them, that's 20 to 30 percent right off the Lost. top that they're yeah. not getting. Yeah, they left that money on the table. Yeah. And uh, they're supposed to collect that, by the way, by Medicare's rules. They, they're supposed to collect all their copays, but a lot of them don't. They don't have a good system in place to do that. And as this quote here from that article says, that the plans created under the Affordable Care Act, uh, sometimes known as Obamacare, that has the potential to add to this burden, this challenge that the doctors have of collecting on these copays and deductibles. Again, with the wrong technology, a lot of that money is going to be left on the table. Yeah, if you'll go to the next slide there, it kind of it explains it a little bit further, what we're talking about here. Uh, and basically, it's coming from the American Asso Medical Association, the AMA, and really other physician groups warn that physicians will get stuck with bills from patients who take advantage of their medical services during that time, but then fail to pay their premiums. <laughs> Do you get that, Patrick? <laughs> yeah. In other words, they signed up for the ACA. Uh, they, they signed up for Obamacare and they, they wanted to go in and get some things fixed. So they went to the doctor, got all these services performed, and then they went back home and, and uh, I guess canceled the insurance. They didn't pay the premiums and so the insurance was canceled. But they got the services. Now the doctor is stuck with the bill for that, right? He's not gonna collect his money probably. Exactly. So this, this problem is a compounding problem of what we already had a service for, for helping doctors put, take care of co-pays and deductibles already. Uh, and whenever you start to learn more about these services, this choice pay service, is the solution that we were talking about before this ACA problem came about. And so what this service does, it helps the doctors collect those uh, that money up front, and especially these higher deductibles, Patrick. I mean, some people have deductibles as, as high as $5,000. Yeah. And, you know, they can't, nobody can pay that in one, write a check for that nowadays, so they can pay over time. And so this choice pay solution gives that doctor's office to get that deductible paid over a period of time for that particular patient. Yeah, basically it just gives the patient more payment options, which of course means more revenue for the doctor because the more ways a patient can decide that they want to pay, uh, the more apt that the doctor is going to get more of his money. Again, maybe not all of it. I think nationwide doctors only collect 50% of all the money that, that patients uh, owe. With choice pay, we can boost that thing up to even 98%. Uh, so it's a tremendous service. The doctors love it when they see this. It's a great door opener that some of our licensees use when they walk in to talk to the doctor because they have a problem with their copays and deductibles, for sure. Every one of them does. That is, that is certainly true. That is certainly true. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, you're asking the question, can this business be run uh, from home? Absolutely. This is a home-based type business. It can be started in the back bedroom of your house. Uh, because of the technology, you need an internet connection, a decent computer, a computer that's, if you're on here today, you've got a decent computer. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that's the bottom line. So basically, that's all you need. So hopefully that answers your question there. All right. Good. Number three, Patrick, uh, administrative burdens. Now, 
you would think that you and I made all of these categories up. These are the actual categories from that magazine article there. And, and we've covered these before in the past. Yeah. Hey, uh, Stephen's asking about choice pay uh, before we go on. Uh, okay. Stephen, the best way to learn the details of all these services, since we try to cram a lot into this hour, is to go to our website and go through that virtual brochure. We actually take uh, time to go through and explain more about those uh, services one by one. This is kind of a, if this is your first webinar, for example, it's probably kind of confusing because we got a lot of different services we're going to talk about, but we just can't cover all of them today. So be sure and ask your ABS rep about that. He says, thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So all administrative right. burdens. Wow. Paperwork is basically what that boils down to. Yeah, th these are going to be some very interesting quotes that we're going to see from here from, from, from some doctors. But, you know, from the Practice Profitability Index, they, they did this study back in 2013, and an increase of paperwork per week uh, went from 58% in 2013 to 70% in 2014. That is unbelievable. Uh, now, Patrick, I thought we were going to electronic medical records, and a lot of doctors have gotten on that. That means supposedly no paperwork in the. In I think the biggest shock to some people when they get in this business is when they go out there and talk to a doctor's office, and they actually look and see that they are filing their claims still on paper. Now, that's not the huge majority, but it's still there. And besides all that, Eric, the administrative work can be include what time the staff spends on their own computer system doing the billing. Think of all the hours and hours that are spent inside the doctor's office just trying to collect the money that the patient, uh, the doctor's already, uh, you know, earned from seeing the patients. Yeah, exactly. And in and, 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 and this air, in, in this, where we are in 2015, you would think that there would be less paperwork because that's what the government's pushing the doctors to have. Right. And all this electronic stuff that's going on, I, it's almost mind-boggling that there's more paperwork or an increase of paperwork that the doctors are finding. Well, I remember when, when computers first came out, they said, well, that'll be the end of paper, right? And then uh, with all the printers, all the printers and, and toner and, and uh, ink that's used, there's more paper probably generated than there was before computers, wouldn't you think? <laughs> it, yeah, especially in a doctor's office. But Getting to some of the quotes from these doctors here are just really, really amazing. Uh, this one, I think, is from Dr. Michael Murphy. Patrick, just, you yeah. got to read it. Yeah, uh, he says, I can't stand saying it, and I can't believe that physicians say this, but patient care has almost gotten in the way of documentation and charting. In other words, what he's saying is that the most important thing in this office, which is to help patients get well and stay well, has it gets in the way of all of the administrative stuff that we have to deal with. That's sad, isn't it? No, oh, that is sad. And I think you, you know, we have on previous webinars, uh, people ask us, why would a doctor use me? I, I think that's probably one of the biggest questions. Why would a doctor use me? I'm brand new. I'm just not getting into this business. Why would a doctor use me? This is why, because what you want to do is keep that doctor doing what they're good at doing, and that is seeing patients, not documenting and charting. That's right. Now, we had a question from Gene that kind of goes back, I think, uh, a couple of slides when we were talking about uh, the uh, patient not paying the premiums on Obamacare, and so they got all these services that the doctor's stuck with. He says, well, when a patient is billed for services uh, and doesn't pay his premiums, how does that affect us? Well, it, it affects us and the doctor primarily because instead of them being covered by insurance and the doctor getting paid by the insurance company, now he has to go after that money from the patient themselves. And as I said earlier, we've got uh, uh, stat statistics uh, from several companies that say that the uh, patients don't, don't pay but about 50% of what they're billed. So that's why, that's why it affects us. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for us. As medical billers, it's just a bad thing for the doctor. Uh, Dr. Murphy goes on to say, by the way, that's what's driving physicians to uh, sell their practice. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, too, are we, in a second, uh, Eric? Yeah. On average, he says you're seeing 25% sustained productivity losses around the country. So, again, we're talking about administrative stuff. 
and that is cutting back on what the doctor's productivity is. That means he doesn't get to see patients as long as he should. He doesn't get to see as many patients, and that's bad for our whole healthcare system. Yeah, exactly. You know, Dean, you asked me a great question here about Obamacare or AC, what we know as the ACA. Uh, has Obamacare increased this paperwork? Yeah, to some degree it ha actually has just because, again, the doctors are they're, they're just trying to do whatever they can to fill out paperwork. And a lot of the cases, they're not having to do that. If, if, if we can get them processed properly in our EMR system through iClaim, we can help drastically reduce uh, to meet the needs of the ACA and to meet the needs of their patients and then to meet the needs of the things that are required. One of them is, uh, we, we talk about administrative burdens, and one of them, Patrick, is just the prior authorizations. This kind of goes along with, is a, is a patient approved to receive a service? Right. So look at this. Now, these are back from uh, a couple of years ago, some of them, three or four years ago, but these are the latest statistics that we had, so we pulled them. 20, 20 hours a week are spent by physicians on prior authorization activities. Now, imagine half of your week being taken up by dealing with making sure that either the patient is approved or finding out why they weren't approved and why we saw them anyway. <laughs> that's, uh, that's 868 million number of hours that physicians spend annually on prior authorizations or about 83,000 per doctor. So Eric, if we could cut that in half, that, that increases the doctor's revenue by what, $40,000? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And so these are some of the, the, uh, the issues uh, that you could be facing in helping the doctor bring a solution. And and on this particular slide, we, we put in, because each of these solutions that we've got out here, whether it's iClaim, EMRX, iDocs Now, the Audit Guard, Choice Pay, Quick Collect, Code Write, whatever, we put all of these here right there just because all of these somehow touch the, that administrative burden that those doctors are under. That's right. And, and these are solutions that are provided to you as an ABS licensee. So once you've gone through our website and our virtual brochure and you understand the whole concept of us putting you in the business for yourself, you're provided all of these services that we've come up with to be able to go out and help the doctor with all of these different solutions. So again, you'll need to go through that virtual brochure probably to read about all these and, and see what the details are about them. But we just wanted to kind of give you a picture that folks, we've done our homework. We've been in this business for 20 years. We know what it takes to help a doctor solve these problems, and uh, we've come up with those for our licensees. Over the years, we've added each one of these things that you see here, and uh, we're even working on some more, aren't we, Eric? Don't talk about that now. Okay, now Rich is asking a question here. I'm going to uh, pose this question to you, and because it kind of goes along with, I think, good right here. Uh, Rich asks the question, what type of business license do we need to get once we become a licensee. Now that all depends on the city that you're in. You have to check with your own city, uh, call you know the courthouse downtown and just ask them, is there some kind of license that I need to run a business? Normally there might be one if you've opened a retail space of some kind or an office, but again, most of our licensees run it out of their home unless they have some specific guidelines on running a business from your home. And usually that's only for businesses where people would be coming to your office and no one ever comes to our licensee's offices. They go out and speak with the doctor in their office. And the doctor doesn't care. Nowadays, 50% uh, of all businesses are run out of their home anyway, uh, and so they don't care, you know, as long as the, the job is done. Exactly. And, and Jacqueline, you're asking about the, how do we obtain a license, uh, and is it valid in California? Again, that kind of goes back to just maybe your area, but let's, let's make sure that we've got this buttoned up here. You don't need a license or a certificate of any sort or a certification to do medical billing. There's none of that needed. Now, we provide you a certification at the end of our training right. uh, that you can share with the doctor, yes, I am certified in medical revenue management, but a license is not anything like if you have to be like a doctor, you have to be a licensed physician to do the do seeing patients. Right. It's nothing like that. Yeah, I use that term licensee, and I just assume people understand what I'm talking about. Basically, folks, it just means that once you've licensed our system and our training and our materials, marketing, and so forth, then you become a licensee, kind of like a franchisee. It's just a different term that's used for 
uh, an opportunity like ours. Exactly. Let's go on to number four, Patrick. I mean, this is, again, right out of the medical economics uh, section here. And this, this is number four, rising operational costs. Yeah, more than 84% of physicians surveyed by medical economics said their practice are doing the same or worse financially uh, more than, than a year ago, according to the t- uh, 2014 uh, physician practice survey. So folks, the doctors are not getting any more money. They're certainly not growing. They're not increasing income. In many cases, it's worse financially than, than it was a year ago. Exactly. So here's the here's the key point that everybody should have a somewhat of a learning takeaway here these are the reasons why doctors would need you this is how we're going to help position you to become the medical billing company that they need to help reduce these operational costs there's three challenges that are faced underneath this one area of operational costs and let's go through those just real quickly yeah one of them goes back to the affordable care act uh, it says 49 percent of physicians reported seeing profits at their practice dip <laughs> because specifically of the affordable care act now folks that's not a good thing. Doctors deserve, look, they went to college for 12 years probably, an internship and all that included. And then they spent $100,000 probably plus opening up their practice. They deserve to make a decent income for what they do. You may think, well, the doctors are all making uh, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year, but that's not the case. It used to be, but it's dipped way down. I'm talking about way down to the $150,000 a year. Now, again, that may sound like a lot of money to you, but for a doctor, uh, that's not what they deserve to be earning. So this is important that you know that half of those doctors have reported that their income dipped. That's challenge number one, uh, the ACA. Challenge, yeah, challenge number two has to do with those codes. Now, this may be brand new to a lot of you, and you see this ICD-10. This is the diagnosis code. Remember, If you remember earlier on in, in the, the webinar, uh, the doctor has to explain in a code format what's wrong with you. Like, I've got a sore throat. I've got an ingrown toenail. Uh, and that is represented by a code. Right now, currently, we're in the ICD-9s. We're changing from 9s to 10s this year, this October. So I wanted to uh, explain that real quickly because the challenge is, is that the ICD-10, the new, more complex medical coding system, is resulting in more software and training costs to the practice. So now, Patrick, not only, yeah, not only did their income dip, as we saw in the previous challenge, but they've got more costs now out of pocket for trying to get everybody up to speed on the new codes. And again, the good news for our licensees is that those codes are already built into iClaim. They're in our system already, right now. We were ready, uh, Eric, before October 1st of last year. Uh, so we're, we're already set for those things. So if you can go in and tell the doctor, look, you don't have to spend a lot of time and training and uh, updating costs on these new codes because we've got it built into our system for you already. And the doctor has access to all that, of course, uh, because it's a cloud-based system. You can give them a, a password and a, a username, and they can go in and see those codes themselves. Exactly. And, you know, the funny thing is, Patrick, you know we do demos for doctors, and sometimes I like to show Uh, not only the doctors, but even uh, prospects that are looking to get in our business that we do have the new codes, uh, there is some hilarious ones there. I mean, uh, getting struck by a turtle. uh, The doctors realize that, wow, you really do have those codes already in there. So, folks, it it is, uh, we're well ahead of the game. Yes. Now, here's challenge number three uh, on operating costs. Although most physicians, 85% of them, have transitioned to some type of electronic health records, to comply with the meaningful use, according to the Physicians Foundation survey, is putting a heavy burden on the docs. This is not cheap. Published statistics from the Michigan Center for Effective IT Adoption says the average five-year total cost of an in-office system is $48,000. For a cloud-based system, like we provide to the the doctor at at no cost, basically, it's $58,000 just to implement that in the doctor's office. And then there's yeah, hidden costs, of course, uh, as well. Yeah, costs in addition to the initial purchase that the, uh, many of the, these physicians are citing in this article. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, there is not a doctor that is uh, being taken care of by any of our licensees 
that's paying anything near close. not even close no. you can go in and offer to the doctor for just pennies on these dollars you see here <coughs> excuse me the ability to get himself and his staff into an electronic medical record system they all want it but believe me they're not happy with the ones they've purchased a lot of them we're going to see that here in a second yeah and can Continuing furthering on in this, uh, concluding this recent survey, again, by the medical economics and market research firm MPI Group, nearly 70% of physicians said the transition to EHRs was not worth it and they would not purchase the system again because of poor functionality and higher cost. Yeah. So really, folks, when people ask us, well, what kind of competition do we have out there in the marketplace? Really, there's hardly any competition because our system because it is cloud-based and because we provide that to you, you can then in turn provide that to the doctor at, again, just a very low cost. Now, again, there are some costs to be able to access the system. It's kind of like a subscription on a monthly basis. That's something that's covered in our virtual brochure, so you need to go to that to find out the details about that. But believe me, it's not anywhere near $48,000. <laughs> And, and the solution that Patrick's talking about is the electronic medical records EMRX on our side. It is a cloud-based, web-based uh, uh, portion for the doctors that they're going to absolutely love. The, the cost that is is for the doctors on this is, like Patrick said, is pennies on the dollar compared to the fifty-eight thousand dollars that we've seen there so far. Yeah, we get a question every once in a while, Eric, from licensees, look, people looking into our business, of what their ongoing costs are to access the system. Well, basically, it's not. It, there is no cost to you. This is something that the doctor is paying for. You just then have access to it and are the administrator of it and do the billing through the system. So, yeah, it's a wonderful way we've worked it out so the licensees don't have a lot of uh, upfront costs to do anything but just find a doctor and show them the advantages through our free practice analysis. Yeah, oh, now here's a big one coming up, Eric. This is uh, yeah. something a lot of people bring up because they've heard that doctors are being bought up by large hospital systems and so forth. So it's it's this challenge, independence versus employment. Uh, physicians are really pretty upset at the pressure to give up their independent practice. And they have to in some cases because again, their cash flow is so low. Uh, our yeah. licensees have gone in and literally salvaged doctors. We have kept doctors from going out of practice because exactly. we provided these solutions to them. Yeah, and I think this this is a great question. I mean, it's certainly we're addressing it head on. A lot of people ask, well, aren't doctors flocking and going, they're getting bought up by hospitals and they're quitting their practice and they're, they're joining big hospital groups. You, you're gonna be shocked to see these, some of the quotes from real doctors here in just a moment. But Patrick, what this, this is says is for some physicians joining a large hospital, sometimes offers a haven from those rising administrative burdens, we've talked about that already, uh, of staying independent and from competitive pressures that can drive a small practice into insolvency. But, the article goes on, joining the hospital system is not a solution for the challenges facing uh, physicians. So here we go. Look at this quote here. This yeah. is by a doctor who's been in practice for over 30 years. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, uh, this doctor, uh, Hina Raggio, uh, joined the hospital system in 2011 after 30 years of being a partner in a two-physician surgical practice. So she was in private practice. But she soon found out, after going to work for the hospital, that she preferred independence to being someone else's employee. Now look what she says. Now I'm going to have to reinvest everything to get back into private practice. So. Eric, we've heard that story many, many times already, haven't we? Doctors going to a hospital, then saying, yep. you know what? I don't like the uh, control over my hours, the limiting of my income. They're not independent business owners. They want exactly what you folks want by getting into your own business. They want control over their lives. They want to take off when they need to, when they want to, when they can. They want to go on vacation with their families. They want to have a staff that does th the work for them uh, in a lot of cases. It's the same thing that people are looking for. Hey, there's a couple of questions, Eric, I'd like to address if we could just before we go to the next slide. Uh, Rich says, how do you get the business of a doctor who just invested money into software for the new Obamacare? Well, actually, of course, there's no, uh, he's referring to electronic health record system, of course, not Obamacare itself, it doesn't have software. But anyway, we know what you're saying, Rich. And you know what? We've seen this happen. 
uh, many, many doctors who've already invested in other systems have, have just jumped the whole thing and gone with our licensees because it solved all their problems and has no downsides to it. So when you say, how do we convince them? We don't really convince them. They convince themselves. They look at our proposals and uh, come back and say, hey, I, I like what I see. Sign me up. Yeah, matter of fact, if you look at the next person down here, Dean, Dean, I don't know what specialty or you're in or what, what you're, where you come from, but <laughs> Dean says, been there and done that. that. Yeah. Your thing's more efficient and cost effective. It is, Dean. And if you'll, if you'll ask to see a demo of it, it will blow you away because anybody that's been using some other kind of EMR system or billing system, uh, they're really impressed with it. Exactly. Let's continue on. Uh, we'll get to the, some more questions that are coming in here. But again, we're getting about 15 minutes out from uh, finishing up here. Okay, we're still on independence versus employment. Physicians are annoyed at these pressures, folks. Look at this uh, quote here. Some physicians are returning to private practice because their compensation from hospitals became less attractive after the expiration of their initial contract. So, Eric, what do they do? They, they bring them in and uh, they, they, they lower that, don't they? After what? Yeah, they look at their, look oh, here it is right here. During an yeah. initial honeymoon period, their pay was based on the previous three years of tax returns. So the hospital pays them what the average was of the last three years. But after the contracts are up, the hospital switched to performance-based pay, which ended up being lower. That's dirty, isn't it? That's very dirty. Uh, and, and this is why we're seeing after a doctor has gotten into a, uh, a hospital that basically two or three years, they're back out. And here's the sad part about it. And, and, and a lot of people may not know this that are on, that's on the webinar today, but this is something you need to kind of tuck away in the back of your head that when a doctor leaves a private practice, goes to the hospital, the top, basically the doctor's book of business, all of their patients goes from their private practice to the hospital. Guess what? When the doctor leaves the hospital to go start their practice up, it's they don't not get their patient. patients with them. Right. They can't. They start all over. Yep. Start from scratch as if they just got out of school. Hey, this question from Jory is interesting. It says she sounds it sounds like there has been a an influx and increase of administrative work in the doctor's offices. There has, yes. On average, how many billing specialists are needed for one doctor's office? Mm -hmm. I guess the best way to sum that up would be uh, let's take one doctor uh, seeing 20 patients a day. That's 100 patients a week. Let's say uh, one person. How many hours do you think that they would spend on seeing, say, uh, 100? It'd be 100 claims that they're doing what, maybe a day, day and a half, even with any kind of follow-up, I guess. Yeah, I mean, certainly you've got the process of um, putting the patients in there. And sometimes, I mean, a lot of times the doctor's office, their staff is going to put the patient's information into the system, and then you, as a medical billing company, are going to process the claims that the doctor sees during that day. So Patrick said 20 patients a day. That's average. 20 to 30 could be about that. Yeah. If you're working with just that one doctor, uh, once you've kind of got through the initiation and uh, phase of getting the doctor set up, that's only going to take you about an hour, hour and a half of work at the most. Yeah. Uh, and you've reduced that, that administrative work in that doctor's office tremendously because what they're doing is you're removing a lot of that bulk of billing information from their office to your office, and you're taking that that does reduce the, the administrative yeah, so work. Jory, so, Jory, that means that basically uh, our licensees tell us that they can usually handle uh, literally a handful of doctors on that average that we just gave you. You could do five doctors and still probably not put in 40 hours a week. Right, exactly. And, and at some point, you have to hire somebody else to help with that, of course, as you grow. All right, let's move on to number six there, Patrick. We're talking number about six. six with technology. Yeah, that's a biggie, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's everything's, you know, I think everybody can see a lot of these tie in with one another, but we're, we're these are broken down into each of these sections. Uh, yeah, so here's, here's the Medical Group Management Association, which is a big organization of medical billing companies all over the world. And 20, in 2014, they did a cost survey. Look, they found that the median cost of business operations, which included the IT staff, uh, you need somebody to handle all your computers and network and virus and updates and all that. It's about $52,000 per full-time physician. Folks, it won't cost the doctor $52,000 probably just to outsource the billing to you. Right. 
<laughs> so doctors are spending unbelievable amounts of money keeping the uh, billing in-house, thinking and not knowing and not being educated like we educate them on the fact that it's cheaper to outsource it. Let, let, me, let me pause here just real quickly because a lot of people, there's nobody asking this question right now, but we had this question asked in the past about what am I going to charge the doctor? And it's going to be on a, on a percentage. And you're going to hear doctors say, oh, I get my billing done for, oh, 2 or 3% because I do it in-house. Folks, what they're not compensating in their calculations are calculations like what Patrick just said. 52000 on average, they don't compensate, they don't compute that within their no. billing a, a percentage. I'll bet if you ask the average doctor, Eric, uh, what do you think it costs you per claim for your staff to file that claim and, and follow up and, and then uh, post the payment once it's paid and so forth? They, they probably say a couple of bucks, wouldn't they? Two or three dollars. They're wrong. It's much, much higher than that. Yeah, I think we we actually we've gotten a quote from one of the doctors that uh, we we kind of showcased on here a couple right. of times. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So that the, the, hopefully that will help you and not be worried about you know going out there and charging the doctor six to eight percent. I mean that's really lower. Oh but yeah. Again, that pace with the technology to keep costs down. The practices have sometimes got a very low cost or free EMRs. That's, yeah. That can be a disaster. Yeah. Uh, in fact, here's the quote. It says, those products work well for some physicians, depending on their circumstances, Dr. Zeter says, but some practices have found that such EHRs fall short of their expectations. Eric, I can't tell you how many licensees have signed up doctors that were using a free EHR and then realize that these ads that pop up are actually advertising drugs. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it's it's pushing drugs on the doctor and putting subliminal messages in his mind. That's against the law, basically. Uh, but even if it wasn't, those doctors find that those free EHRs are free up to a certain point. It's just like software. You download a trial and it's free, yes. But do you want this, 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 and this? Yes. So eventually it does cost the doctor. They're not free at all. Right. And, and so the solution for that, again, is our full platform here that you're seeing here, the iClaim, the EMRX, everything that goes along with that in there. We are keeping pace with technology. And I, I actually think, Patrick, I think we're surpassing. Yeah, uh, yeah we're way ahead of uh, any other company that I know of out there. We've won all kinds of awards for the fact that we are using the latest stuff. And folks, uh, this technology behind all this, there's a couple of doctors that help develop this whole system. And uh, they are the ones that continue to make sure that this is updated. We've got full-time programmers on staff behind this technology that's keeping this up to date because things change. And unless you keep up, you're gonna fall behind. That's why we're signing up more doctors uh, this past year than we ever have before. Right. Uh, Dean's asking a question here. We'll, we'll go ahead and take another question here from Dean. Uh, will will we be taking jobs away from the doctor's office? Oh, I get that a lot. Uh, they People feel sorry for the fact that there's somebody in the doctor's office doing the billing. Well, if you take it over, of course, what does that person do? So let me put it this way, folks. First of all, most people in a doctor's office learned how to do the billing from the person before them. Uh, they didn't necessarily have any kind of training in medical billing. They were brought in to help with the doctor's office functions and the administration and then taught how to do the medical billing because that's how it, it's on the job training. And so that person's doing not only that, but a dozen other things for the doctor. And that's why they can't focus on it and do as well as you can. So what we do is we go in and we show the staff and the doctor that we're going to basically take over the billing, but that's going to free up the staff. Now, what are they going to do if they have all this spare time? Well, they can see that many more patients or the doctor can spend more time with the patients, which is going to build good word of mouth, right, from those patients to other friends and relatives. So, no, in many, many cases, nobody leaves the doctor's office. Now, there might be a uh, part-time high school student who's coming in and doing some data entry that they, they don't need anymore. But the people who are there full-time, believe me, there's plenty of other things they can do in the doctor's So all we do is teach them to reallocate the functions and the time of the staff that they currently have. Yeah, Dean says, thank you for answering that question. That was great. All right, let's move on. We're, we're within our 10-minute uh, time frame here before the end of the hour. So let's get to what, what is HIPPO? Tell us about HIPPOs. I mean, I mean HIPAA. <laughs> <Hippos>. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Well, well, uh, well, you can see it right there on the lo logo. It's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Yeah, this, this has to do with patient data and keeping it secured and safe. So the fines that for, viol for violating a lot of this, and you're going to find out what we're talking about, some of the violations are, can be anywhere from $100 all the way up to $50,000. And they're so nice to cap it off at $1.5 million annually. Uh, I doubt it. A whole lot of doctors are worth 1.5 million, so I don't know where they'd come up with that kind of money. But but basically, here's what it is, folks. If they do something that is a breach of the HIPAA rules and regulations for privacy of the patient data, they can be fined. A lot of doctors didn't realize this. The doctors who have their own system on their own computer in their own office, there are all kinds of fines if they don't back that up and store that data off-site somewhere. And then, of course, there's all kinds of rules and regulations about the encryption of the data. Uh, this is why it's dangerous to have it in the office nowadays. The cloud-based system that we use is actually more HIPAA compliant than anything else because it's kept off-site. Nobody can get to it unless they have the, the passwords and the IDs to get into that. Exactly. And and this I love this next quote here because you're talking about security of data uh, versus yeah. what's on the doctor's computer at their office versus whether we store it offline. But it, nobody thinks about what this this attorney talks about. Yeah, so he is an attorney who focuses on this HIPAA thing, and he's a contributor to Meckle e e Economics Magazine. He says that employees may post photos of seemingly innocuous content, such as a picture of their lunch. You know, people do that on Facebook. Hey, look what I had for lunch. Which happens to be sitting on top of a patient chart or order sheet. So. What happens is somebody gets that on Facebook, they can zoom in on that and with some software programs, look at the details of that patient data. That's against the rule. They'll get fined for that. Yeah, they could find out that, uh, you know, you're growing a third ear, Patrick. I mean, that's nobody wants to know about that, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things about my body I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, here are just some of the violation categories here. You can see uh, they didn't know about the breach, so the fines can range from 100 to 50. Uh, had reasonable cause to might know about the breach, that starts off at 1,000. Uh, willfully neglect, but they corrected the problem, that's going to start off at 10 up to 50. And then willful, ne willful neglect and not corrected, you're just getting popped there at $50,000 each violation. Wow, wow. That would, uh, that would bankrupt a lot of doctors real fast, wouldn't it? Yeah. So we have a solution for that. Oh, I've got some more information here real quickly. But, you know, the, the, the little stat that we've got there kind of just shows some things in graphic format. But, you know, in 2009, this is a little bit older uh, uh, survey that's done, but 800 patients data breaches back then, 29 million patient records affected by HIPAA violations, according to the 2013 Redspin Breach Report. That's the report you see to the left. There's a little clipping out of there showing that 137.4% increase of these HIPAA, what's called PHI. This is the uh, the the physician, I mean the the, the patient's health information. Uh, that many more increases of breaches. In, in one year's time, between 2012 and 2013, that's that's shocking to me. 137% increase in these breaches. Yeah. Uh, three of the top breaches, it says, that's tiny tight, but it says three of the top 10 were due to risky administrative password behavior, and 20% of breaches uh, involved a business associate. Now, a business associate, that's important uh, that people know that anybody who deals with the doctor, an accountant, an attorney, their, their IT guy, if that's a separate company, those are business associates, and 20% of the breaches were from those people. Yep, and so that... So our, our solution for that is uh, what's called Compliancy Guard. Uh, as you can see here, this is part of what's in, a lot of people ask Patrick, what's in the physician's toolbox? I know that we, we, we get that asked a lot because that's part of one of the solutions. This is one of those, those, those from the physician's toolbox that we are able to do for that particular doctor's office. So uh, to achieve, illustrate, and maintain just compliancy in its most simplest format, we can take care of that. You can go in there. Matter of fact, this is a great door opener. Patrick, yeah. I think you've actually uh, talked a, bit, a little bit about this in the marketing part of uh, training, but you know, you tell the people just to go in there and ask, uh, I don't know how, how you put that. Go ahead and say that. 
about going well, yeah. in. And, well, well, yeah, if you're, if you're marketing this particular service, when you walk in, you just walk up to the front desk and ask, uh, who, who is your HIPAA compliance officer? Yeah. <laughs> they probably don't have one. Or if the go, person uh, you're talking to, that should, they know they should be the officer, but yeah, it, it, it gets their attention real fast. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, running out of time here. Number eight, implementing ICD codes. That's a huge challenge for doctors. We've already talked about that a little bit. Will they be ready for two, uh, 2015? Eric, I, I venture to say a lot of doctors are not going to be ready for that. In fact, here's a quote from Joshua Berman, director of business analytics, and he says, I guarantee there will be one large payer that's an insurance company, or a few small payers, or both, that won't be ready to process those ICD-10 claims on October 1st. So the doctors are not going to get paid, right? And if the doctors are not ready and they use the old ICD-10 codes on October 1st, guess what? They don't get paid. Yeah. New so problem. part of our solution to that is, is that we get the doctors involved with either code right, we get their codes done properly, or we put the doctor on the EHR side, and you can see there uh, that we, there is the ICD-10 codes already in inside of the, 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 the system there. And we're able to get those doctors those codes to ensure them that come October of this year, they're going to get paid. Yep. Okay, number nine is the EMR. We talked about electronic medical records. And uh, here's a little uh, quote that's basically saying, estimating a return on investment when constructing a business plan for the purchase or switch of an electronic health record system, most practices need to consider four cost centers, hardware, software, implementation, and training, support, and maintenance. Eric, there's a huge cost no matter what system they use. And there is a cost for the doctor. He's going to spend money on some of this, but not on the hardware and software. Those two right. sides over there and the support and maintenance, that's all included. Exactly. So really it's just the implementation, getting this uh, people up to speed on uh, using the electronic medical record system. Yeah, and, and our next slide is basically showing, you know, what doctor's offices are faced with. If they're going to buy a service, they're going to run it in their office, 33 grand, 4,000 years costly for it to run that. A lot of web-based systems start off at 26, go up to eight grand a year on yearly cost, folks. Uh, we're underneath the yearly cost without the upfront cost. That's right. Doctors. Yeah, no comparison. No, uh, no comparison at all. And, and when you see the demo, again, ask your ABS rep to show you a demo of the system. That's the way it will convince you. Uh, listen, when we show this to a doctor, we'll, we'll actually show it to you as if we're showing it you know, to a doctor of yours, a prospective doctor. You'll be doing the same thing the doctors do, which is just wow <laughs> throughout the whole thing. And, and let's not forget that we're not in software sales. Uh, right. The reason we show this the, the systems to you is simply just to show you how you're going to able to increase the doctor's cash flow. That's yeah. that's what we focus on there. Yeah. Bottom line is we're going to show him all the benefits, not necessarily the features of our software. We're going to talk about the benefits to him, and they get it. They put it all together. They see how that they, doing the eligibility before the patient is seen, of course, in real time. We grab the data from the insurance company in real time over the internet. That is awesome stuff, and the doctor just goes bonkers when they see that. Okay, number 10, payers yep. dictating health care. What this is talking about, folks, is the payers, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, insurance companies. Uh, it says, I received, this doctor says, I received my first request for an audit a few weeks ago from a Medicare chart. So what we're getting to is that doctors can be audited, yes, even for the codes that they put in. They may be overcoding, for example, to get paid more. Or if they're undercoding, of course, they're leaving money on the table. So either way, uh, we can help them with that. Here's a quote from ta 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 Tatiana. Tatiana. Yeah. <laughs> the federal government can audit Medicare's patients' charts while individual states can audit the records for Medicaid patients since they fund Medicaid up to 10 years after a patient's treatment. So Eric, these doctors are liable for mistakes that they made 10 years ago. Exactly, and I uh, love the quote that we're gonna see here, and this is actually from a local doctor here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Yeah, Mary Ann Block, she says, because of uh, her foreknowledge to stay independent of these outside payers, she says, I believe in the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship. That third party, whoever it is, should not be in the middle of it. And <laughs> So I like that. Cool. I'm, she, I'm on her side. <laughs> yeah, she looks like she uh, would tell those payers where to go. I'm telling you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the here's the reference again. Uh, so, Eric, let's just move past that if we can. I'm going to see what's coming up here next. 
And uh, that's it. We we can cover yeah. we have questions here. Well, yeah, it's we, it. It is. I tell you, we 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 packed in a ton of information. We've answered most of your questions. Let me tell you about the questions here that you've typed in. We we have captured all of your questions here. Uh, these will be forwarded over to your AVS rep who you're working with. They'll be happy to go over. If we've missed your question, it's not because we didn't want to answer it. Folks, we just run out of time. And I think some of the, the questions actually got answered as we kept going through it. So we'll certainly take care of that. But let's kind of wrap up here uh, more on the business side of American business systems and talk about, you know, what you offer here with the money back guarantee, Patrick. Yeah, we're pretty proud of the fact, folks, that that not only do we know that we have something that's good, a great opportunity for you and for the doctors, but we back it up with a 100% money back guarantee. Now, I don't know of any company in America, Eric, that does what we're doing here. We let people come to our training workshop, and if for any reason they don't think this business is right for them, they simply tell us at the end, and we'll arrange for them to receive a full refund of that license fee that they paid to us. Every penny of it is given back to you. Now, you're out a little bit for travel and your hotel stay while you're here, let's say $1,000. Folks, that's cheap to investigate a business like this. So don't take our word for it. Just come on down to the training. Uh, set through the training and see if what it is is real. Have we given money back? Yes. In 20 years, we've, we had three people come to us during the training that have asked for the money back. And those were very personal reasons why they had to get out. But think about this, folks. There's no other company that would let you see all of their proprietary information and still get all your money back unless we we're pretty sure that we know what we're doing here. Yeah, we've got a YouTube uh, channel here, Eric, all right? Yeah, absolutely. You can go to our, our YouTube channel uh, for AB, American Business Systems, YABS, right there at YouTube.com, YABS. You can follow us on Twitter as well. Uh, and if you need even more information and you keep doing your due diligence, uh, if you want to get, there's a book out there from Entrepreneur Magazines called Start Up Your Own Medical uh, Claims Billing Service. And uh, we're, uh, we're actually, they actually listed us, we didn't even know about this until after the fact, that they've listed us as one of the business opportunities to help you get started in medical billings. So